Hello, Stephanie. Thank you for joining me on the She Leads Me podcast today. How are you? I'm fabulous. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to chat with you, hear about your story. You have such a, an amazing, just multifaceted story. And I'm thrilled to have our audience uh, get to know you and learn about your past and how you've become this successful woman in your life now. So why don't you go ahead and start by introducing yourself and letting our audience know who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, so I am Stephanie Thornton Plymel, and I am the CEO of Heritage School of Interior Design. And I'm the author of American Daughter, which just came out three weeks ago. And I'm a mother of three and a wife. And I definitely see myself as an entrepreneur. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, you've gone on to do some pretty amazing things. Tell us a little bit about the story. Let's first start with your your career now like a little bit prior to the book. So choosing to not only just go into interior design, but then creating your own school, take Mm -hmm. us on that journey of kind of what drove you to that career in that industry and uh, how it evolved into where it is today. Absolutely. So, you know, I, a little bit about my history and American daughter, I was um, virtually in foster care and homeless um, pretty much all the way up until I got married. I was um, living in the back of my mother's car. We lived on the beach. We lived in a motel. I was in an orphanage. Foster- so no home. I never experienced home until I got married and created my own home. But I've always been obsessed with interior design, even as a child, creating, just creating spaces out of nothing, out of just um, debris. And we, you know, we literally lived outside for a long time in a car. Mm-hmm. So I grew up, I just was obsessed with interior design and I started my own design business, went to school, started my own design business, had a really successful design career for about 18 years, but then it was time for me to, I was ready to do something new and evolve even from that. So I went back to school, studied business, um, studied um, whole person coaching, got a degree in that. And I studied, went to art school. So I just started really developing myself, not really knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then Heritage School of Interior Design had closed down and was for sale, basically was nothing. It had just shut down. So I thought, oh, I think for some reason, I think I can do this. I think this is my next thing. So I bought the school for a very small amount of money (laughs) and (laughs) I revamped the school and I've expanded it to three states. And now it's become one of the premier design schools on the West Coast. Congratulations. Um, (laughs) So that's a little bit of incredible. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I'm curious to know how, you know, such a just rocky childhood, which we'll get into more in just a minute here. But then when you made the intentional choice to move on with your life and and go to school, further your education, Mm -hmm. I would feel that, I mean, a lot of people, even with all of the opportunities kind of question, uh, like, I don't know if I have what it takes to go to school. I don't necessarily Mm -hmm. have the drive. Where did you find that? Like, drive and yeah. mindset of like, I am going to go do this. I'm going to figure out how to enroll myself and pay for it. Despite not being kind of brought up with, yeah. uh, you know, in that encouragement. Yeah. What made you make that choice? I think I just have a lot of grit to be honest. And when I put my mind to something, it's almost impossible to tell me no. I don't even understand the word no, actually. It doesn't even <laughs> connect to me. It's like maybe it's not the right time, but I don't really understand the word no if this is something that I really want to do. And I sometimes your gut just tells you it's time to do this. And I also had become uh I had become less interested in just designing people's houses. I had become interested in doing so much more. And so, um, you know, it was just time. It was just time. And I went to the right schools for me. I like to, I like to focus on one thing at a time, which is how my school is. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I have a hard time with this big, broad education. So I like to, I'm very focused. It was my education that I had just, just created so much more in me. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Even though yeah. I missed those opportunities, and I wasn't able to be in school, the stuff that I've added to my life has really just opened doors for me and I've really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, yeah, just helped you create the life that 
you've intentionally yeah. wanted to create, which is amazing. And I think it's so, just so important not to let people discourage you or tell you mm-hmm. you shouldn't write a book or you shouldn't open a school or you shouldn't do, even though you know that this is the right thing to do, even if it seems a little nutty, it sometimes yeah. it, it is. And you have to follow that. It sounds like you've developed a really strong sense of what your inner voice and intuition sounds like and allowed that to guide a lot of the decisions as opposed to the other voices that are trying to drown that out. Yeah. And and also one of the things that I did in my year, early years, which I think was transformative, is I just really got rid of all negativity in my life. Mm-hmm. Negative people, negative words, negative negativity really in a lot of ways, transformed me into being this very creative person. And yeah, I I am a force in terms of I do not want to take no for an answer. I'll find another way. <laughs> it's not no, it's just not yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I love that. So let's go to your childhood. Yeah. That is... I mean, a a lot already that you've shared with us. And we're just kind of, I don't even know that we're skimming the surface there. We're just kind of like hovering above it. Yeah. Where, when did this all begin for you? This like rocky, no foundation, you know, no home foundation, like unstable childhood. When was that always or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, my first memories really are, um, well, I have a few memories. My brother was kidnapped. That was the first memory. But the other memory of living on the beach with my siblings in the back of a car for at least a year, moving to a motel, which I thought was fabulous because I cleaned motel rooms with my mother and it was my first staging job for me. (laughs) I loved it. It was the first time I ever really had a home and it was just a motel. And so then I went from that to um, an orphanage called the dependent unit, which was like a, a prison for children and then into horrendous foster care. So this went on my entire childhood up until, up until I got married and I chose to have a stable home and a stable family with my husband and have kind of the opposite of what I had. My mother was severely mentally ill. And um, in in American Daughter starts out with me doing these interviews with my mother because I'm estranged with her most of my life. And um, what I find out about her is that she experienced this extreme trauma of being abducted when she was 11 years old and um, and gang raped and held for, for two weeks. And that created her mental illness and that created her drug addiction. So Um, that's why, and the reason why my childhood was so horrendous, there was a reason for it. And that's how American daughter started. And again, we're scratching the surface of even Mm -hmm. the book just with that. So there's just a lot of layers. Yeah. And you had no idea like growing up, your mom did never talk about any of that. Like you had zero idea of what she had experienced. I had no idea, no way of comprehending what she'd been through. So my mother had been in and out of psych wards and prisons probably up to a hundred times in her lifetime. I heard rantings and, you know, psych ward um, ramblings, but none of it made sense until she was diagnosed with cancer. And then I went in to do these interviews. And at that point, I was ready to, to find out the answers to mm-hmm. what had happened. How did my childhood get this difficult? How did she get so mentally ill? And that's when I found out what happened to her. And that's when the forgiveness and empathy for her really started. How long had it been since you had seen or heard from your mom when that call came in? So we had been estranged for years because my mother um, in one of her, so she has, she had different personalities and one of her personalities was very violent and tried to take my child from school, tried to burn my house down and was threatening to kill me. So she went to jail and there was a stalking order between us. So we weren't even allowed to see each other. She couldn't come near me just for my own sake. Um, But again, once she was diagnosed with cancer, I needed to find out. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Mm I went back into her life and that's when, when the healing journey started and everything that, you know, my history of my family came out and, um, 
just all these things that I never knew. So yeah. I'm so thankful that we were able, even with that stocking order, I, I broke the stocking order to get the answers. Yeah. So you mentioned that you had siblings and that this yeah. also horrendous thing had happened to your brother. How many siblings do you have? And were you guys all sort of displaced when all of this was yeah. going on? Did you, did you still, were you guys able to be placed together in foster homes? Were you just completely disconnected? What kind of happened with your family? Well, it's a very tragic actually in the foster care system. Um, even back then was just a horrendous situation. I have four brothers and I have a sister and, um, you know, most, most of them didn't really make it out and they, uh, we were all broken up. So when we were, when my mother went to jail, when we were living at the motel, all of us were, t we were taken to this place called a dependent unit separated there. It's like a prison mm -hmm. for children and then all put into different garish foster homes. So the family unit was really never put back together at all. And my siblings mm -hmm. and I, for the most part, um, are a bit estranged just because there isn't really any family and so much trauma. When you have that much trauma, it's really hard to put the pieces back together. Yeah, I could imagine. Were any of them able to reconcile with your mom like you were able to? I think none of them did the work that I did with my mom. None of them really did the work to heal. I think they um, longed for their mother, loved their mother, but never really did this kind of work to even, I don't even know if they know what happened, if they've even read American Daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, actually. Yeah. Some of them are very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. I mean, when we look at just kind of like the statistical data of what you've experienced yeah. and where you've, you know, created your life to be in the success that you've been able to find, like you are the anomaly, right? Like you are, like there's not, there isn't a statistic for you. <laughs> like you have just really come out on top and in so many incredible ways that does take that grit that you were talking about mm -hmm. and that inner strength to really lean into the things that you don't know and understand about yourself, really having to face trauma, which is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then really going through that process of becoming at peace and healing through it, which is a, its mm -hmm. own separate journey, right? So there's like all of these journeys along the way that just take so much to go through. Um, you know, it, it is so sad, tragic, like you mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, your siblings have the life that they have because of all of that trauma yeah. and really quite amazing that you've been able to um, move through that. When Thank you, you, yeah, when you look at the journey that then your mom and you went through mm -hmm. on the healing side, were you, how, how did you choose to approach going from intense trauma that people can't even imagine and, mm -hmm. you know, no contact orders and all of that? What tools did you guys use to, to heal? How did you mm. even start that process together to get through to a more peaceful side before she passed? Mm -hmm. That's such a great question. So what I did, and I think this is a really great tool for people who may be estranged and, and especially with somebody like my mother who had no boundaries, there was no boundaries around her illnesses and and her capabilities. So I set up these interviews. So the tool was for her, I'm going to be here at two o'clock. We're going to have an hour long interview where I'm going to ask you whatever questions I need to ask, and you're going to answer them. And I just set it up very, very strong. And she was fine with that. Now, I couldn't mm. just say we're going to talk about everything. But when I set these interviews up, she felt like that was a good boundary for her. She could handle it. These interviews went on for two years. So what mm -hmm. ended up happening was through the interviews, through finding out what happened to her, through me finally mattering and saying this, I matter. And you're going to hear from me and what happened to me. And you're going to, even though she was sociopath, she couldn't have empathy for me. Mm -hmm. She still had to hear and listen. And I, and I got that chance to matter. And then through that process, um, this empathy that I had for her and my mother, 
I really do believe grew to have empathy in, in the end for me. And we started this healing reconciliation all the way up until the last day that she was alive and wasn't in coma and in a coma, you know, we sat there with holding hands in just a state of love, but this was a two year interview process. Yeah. There was a lot there that we had to process. It wasn't just this, I forgive you. This was Mm -hmm. a process of forgiveness. Do you feel like you had enough time to really get that healing process for yourself? Or did you feel like it was cut a little short? Good. Good. I, I feel like I got what I needed. I mean, I'll, I, I feel like if I have regrets, which I don't really have, is that I wish I would have asked the question sooner mm. because um, her, her three different personalities that she had, one being Violet, one being a little girl, one being herself, um, those are all symptoms of extreme trauma, as I've learned from my therapist. I didn't ask those questions. I was so scared of the personalities. This could have happened a little bit sooner. She could have been had healing sooner. That's the only thing. But we did have, I really got the mother that I really longed for in the end, even if it was such a short time. I'm not out looking for a mother anymore. I was always on the mm-hmm. hunt for a mother and yeah. I, that's, that's gone. Yeah. I have my mother. And so yeah. that's, that is, I feel really fulfilled with it. I miss yeah. her. I miss what we had for that short time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I could imagine being able to have that, that taste of the mom you've always longed for and then have it end so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- there's also the side of it that, you know, maybe she wouldn't have been ready for these conversations earlier. You know, mm-hmm. if you had have brought them up, maybe, maybe that wouldn't have been an opportunity. Uh, you know, you just, never know when people are, are ready for those types of really challenging things, you know, I think you're right. And I think it really had a lot to do with the fact that she was at her end of life and I had taken guardianship of her. So I had absolute control of her medications. I had control of her health. Um, and so the whole scenario was set up for us to do the work Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In this in your childhood, was there ever a father figure around? Did you have another adult sometimes in your life that maybe was, was there for you as well? No, (laughs) if you read uh, American daughter, my mom had, um, I had my stepfather, Rick, who was a drug addict, a junkie, a con artist. And, um, but in the end, Rick got sober and became the most amazing human being and I loved Rick, even when he was a drug addict con artist. I don't know why I just loved him. There was a sweetness that I think I saw in him mm-hmm. that nobody else saw. I don't know how I even saw it. I, you know, one of the things that really worked for me is I, I've always been very observant and curious, and I've always looked for the things that I want in life. So whether it was one of my friend's parents I would see that that's what I want. So I had this capability of looking for what I wanted and deciding I'm not going to be like my mother. I'm not going to be a drug addict. I'm not going to be like my brother's drug addict. I'm going to go this way. So that was really, um, and a lot of survivors are that way who, who are looking for what they want um, instead of just becoming what they see. Mm -hmm. And, And so that was a really, that was, that was a really big strategy for me. And I had, um, I had a foster mom who was very much somebody that I admired in the end. She, um, was a terrible foster mom, but there was things about her, her strength that I think I got from her too. So there's just little bits and pieces of people that I took to, to help make me whole, if that makes sense. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. You just, you found the pieces that worked for you and that's definitely a, survivor skill, right? It's Mm -hmm. just like, you have to get a little bit scrappy. You just have to figure (laughs) out like, you know, what pieces like will really be there to serve you. And, uh, I think it's quite an amazing skill actually to be able to do that and, and to be able to get the things that you do need. Yeah. When, so there's this time where then you have healing with your mom and then Mm -hmm. there is an entirely different process that I would think would come up when then you go to put all of this experience in life 
into a book. <laughs> yeah. As you've had healing and worked with, like you mentioned, working with a therapist and all of that, what else came, did you, were you surprised at the book writing process? Um, were you surprised at anything that came up for you when you started to actually get it out there and get it out of your mind and get all of that experience Mm -hmm. down in written form? Mm -hmm. It was so cathartic. I recommend it for anybody to, to write, write, write. Um, it, you just getting it out. There's there's something so empowering about getting your story out, whether it's a book or a blog or a journal or a therapist or somebody. It's so empowering. Um, yeah, there was times when I was doing these interviews where I never wanted to go back and see my mother, and I would say, I am not going back. She is so mean. She's she was so demeaning to me um, at times, and so but I just couldn't stop myself. I had to keep going back, and I kept getting answers. I kept writing, and all of this, you know, we haven't even touched on what happened. You know, I came from nothing and nobody. I came from I didn't even know my last name. I didn't even know who my grandparents were. Um, what was revealed before the rape is that my mother came from one of the most prestigious families in our country, the Washingtons, you know, George Washington, Elizabeth Betty Washington, and my grandparents. So this whole entire history of, and all the people who started so many institutions of education were all my grandparents. So I was, yeah. So I, yeah, that, that came out. um, And so this connection to me being an educator and owning these design schools made perfect sense because all of my grandparents were Harvard. They started Harvard. They started the University of Virginia. They started, you know, John Hopkins University um, engineering programs. Here I am starting these amazing design schools. So all these pieces are also starting to come together and, yeah. and create this whole person now. Mm-hmm. I'm not this empty shell of a person. I have a history that's fabulous that I get to have now that was taken from me because of what happened to my mother. Yeah. So, so the writing process for me was awful and hard at times. There's chapters that are unbearable for some readers to read. It was unbearable for me to write, to tell. And then there's just some amazing stories in there. I mean, so many people are connecting to American daughter in their own lives and in their own story. And this is truly an American story. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. When you started to write, were there things that you then started to recall that you hadn't had that memory or you had kind of maybe like blocked that memory before? Were there things that were then kind of coming to light for you um, now that it was a safe place for you to realize those things? Well, I was definitely getting answers. Um, I, I kind of alluded to my brother who disappeared when I was three years old. And we were always told that he was kidnapped. So I had to live with that my whole life, but he really wasn't. I found a box in my mother's um, and all of her stuff with photographs of him, of his whole life that she had been getting. (gasps) And, um, and so we lived with that trauma. We weren't allowed to talk about it, but we didn't know where he was. And um, my mother told me from the time I was little that I was from rape. She never said I had a father, that this was a, from a rape. So I had to live with that shame. And then I got to find my father. <laughs> so, wow. And was that so, the case or was he? No, he, yeah, he was, he was one of, there's uh, the opening chapter is he's, it's one of uh, five men are possibilities. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I got to find him, he was passed away, but my, I've in the meantime, have gotten to find um, some fabulous cousins that are just in my life. And I, I've gotten to put my family back together. So writing American daughter was also living out this story in real life for me, putting all the pieces back. Yeah. And so your, your brother that was kidnapped is alive and yeah. well, so he knew where he was the whole time. She probably lost track eventually. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Did you, did you ask her why <laughs> I would, that would be one of the, that would, or did you not realize that until after 
Oh, I asked her in the interviews, I found, I was going through her stuff. So when I was doing these interviews, I was kind of looking through photographs and like opening cupboards. I mean, (laughs) it was was like uh, sitting on the floor and I just found this box. And the other thing that came out of that box is the photograph that's on the, on the cover of my book was from that box. And, you know, that's a pretty amazing photograph. Like one of the only photographs of me are of, it was in that box, same with my brother. And in wow. being the cover of this book. Wow. So and he and and he's have you reconnected with him at all? No. Um, he's just really rough. Sure. <laughs> he lives yeah. in New York. Sure. And his his it, you know. Yeah. Just, Everybody's had their own experience and, yeah. and had different uh ways that, that impacted them in the process. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then moving forward into the now you have the story out, was this something that you talked about with, uh, your friends and people that were in your life, uh, as an adult, like, did you, did you share no. much of this with anybody? So this Nobody. was like a whole entire <laughs> revelation, yeah. like this, it, like it, revealing story for everybody in your life. How, <laughs> how has that changed any of your relationships now? Like what, um, you know, well, one of my knowledge? best, one of my best friends read the book and was like, really, Stephanie, you didn't tell me <laughs> <laughs> any of this. Yeah. We've been friends for years. Um, no, I just, I felt so much shame, to be honest. Shame held me in for so many years. It's so, so powerful. I felt shame. I didn't know where to start. And I didn't really have my story until I wrote this book, because as I, told you, like I brought everything together. Right. I didn't have the answers. I only had my experiences that I went through as a child and I never really wanted to be a victim. And I think that's one of, one of the reasons that kept me quiet is I never wanted people to look at me as a victim, but to look at me as an empowered woman. And I felt that my past could create that to create those scenarios for people to think that and feel that way about me. And I don't like that. Right. Well, I can definitely tell you right now that my uh, interactions with you, just hearing about your story, like I definitely am feeling the empowered woman vibes all throughout <laughs> my screen and my headphones right now. It's just, it's really, thank you. It's an incredible story of just overcoming so, so much. I mean, there's not, I don't, there's not even a word to describe, uh, what you've been through and how you've just kind of come out the other side. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I hope that you've been able to truly own Thank that you. part of the story of like, yeah, I am a badass. <laughs> like I have like really over, like come through just such intensity. And uh, I hope that is part of your story that you just truly own and wear proudly that you are a badass female. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm starting to really um, get that in my life. It's taken a long time. And, and my my podcast that's coming out in the spring is called Overcoming. And we're sharing stories of amazing people who've overcome. Yeah. Um, but I was being interviewed by my staff and they said, what would you say to your child self? And I said, I would tell my child self who's in that foster home being abused that someday you will matter and you will be a badass. And that's what I told my child. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm getting that. (laughs) Yes. I love that. So then now that, um, your people are hearing about your story, you're starting to reach other people, people Mm -hmm. that may have had varying degrees of, uh, things that they can relate to in this book. I would then think that there would also be this like almost, and maybe not, but for, for me, I would feel like it's a, would feel a little overwhelming to feel then the people coming forward and sharing mm-hmm. how, you know, this has helped them and helped mm-hmm. them get through or helped them maybe take steps towards uh, rehabilitating relationships. Mm -hmm. What's been the response and how has that experience been for you? Oh, it's been wonderful. I mean, if I sat here and shared my story and every person said, wow, you're a freak of nature. I can't relate to this at all. (laughs) That would have been horrible, (laughs) (laughs) but I haven't. It's been, which is what I thought would happen. But what has ended up happening is people are sharing their stories. People like amazing 
people that I've got to meet through this journey of like Oscar winner sharing me, basically sharing her life story with me of how she's overcome intergenerational trauma in her life. And uh, people coming forward with more courage because I did this and they feel empowered to do this in their life. So I've had virtually very little negativity around this. Um, I don't know if it's coming, but I haven't had it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just not just put really... that expectation out there. Yeah, there's there's no negatives coming. It's just only I just don't allow that thing. negativity. And I'm sure you yeah. don't either. You're such a positive person. I can just feel that from you. And you just don't okay. allow that in your life. And right. I hope that this book continues to help and heal relationships and people and opens the door to courage to share your story. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens and how it impacts people. And I've yeah. get to meet great people like you and yeah. I've been on like 35 interviews in the last two weeks and I've met amazing. amazing people. So it's yeah. really, really fun actually. Yeah. I, yeah, this is the, the reward part of the journey, right? Where it's like, okay, we're, you know, I, I, and I truly believe that we're all like, as we evolve with life, there's different healing moments that come Mm -hmm. from the past, different new things that we experience within ourselves. So like, Oh, that still needs a little bit of work, right? Like we still have a little bit of things to really work on there, but just, uh, such an amazing journey you're on. You've mentioned having a podcast. So what's next for you now? Now what (laughs) we have have a podcast coming out, you have your school now, what is next? Well, I'm doing so many fun things. First off, my podcast is just absolutely amazing. I'm just going to be talking to extraordinary people. Um, I'm going to be working on my next book, which is called Overcoming, which is going to be more stories, more people who've overcome and more of my story that I didn't actually get to put into this book. And um, doing a lot of philanthropic work, helping with foster children. I'm helping um, with mental health. I'm doing a lot of publicity for different organizations that are my passion, Heritage Home. Um, I do own schools, so I'm a CEO. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that's it. (laughs) And you're you're a mom and a wife on top of it all. I'm a mom and a wife. (laughs) (laughs) So my plate is full, but it's all yes. stuff that I love. And I'm so excited about my philanthropic work with foster kids. And I want to be doing a lot of talks with foster kids. I want them to have the hope and I want them to get some of these strategies that I've used to get through in their own lives so that we can stop the 70% of foster kids that end up either on the street or in prison. We need to stop this. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that I can have a voice in that. Yeah. Incredible. Stephanie, where can our listeners buy the book, connect with you? What social platforms do you like to hang out on? Tell us all the ways that our audience can, can get connected. So I love, love, love connecting with people on Instagram, Stephanie Thornton Plymel. If you love interior design and you love my book, you'll like following me. And I love interacting with people. I'm on Facebook. Uh, Stephanie dash or excuse me, American dash daughter.com is the website where you could order, you can order American daughter anywhere and everywhere. And it's on the top shelves at Barnes and Noble. If you go there, I'm right next to Kamala Harris. Oh, Pretty fabulous. Exciting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was so excited to see that. Yeah. Um, so anywhere books are sold. Excellent. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for your time and for sharing your journey with our audience today. It was such a pleasure. A pleasure to be here with you. It was a wonderful time talking to you.